My question is about uh, risk-free rates, right? I mean, they are crucial to like understanding financial asset pricing. I mean, right. uh, the problem is a lot of assets that we thought were risk-free, mm. uh, Spanish sovereign debt, up until, uh, as it was trading at a very close spread, as you just yes. said, we thought it was risk-free, it turns out it isn't. The, the question becomes now, uh, now we think German uh, bonds are risk-free, Everybody thinks German bonds are risk-free. We have regulation telling us that we need more risk-free bonds in, in, the asset, in the asset sheets of, of commercial and, and investment banks. Do you think, as the IMF has suggested, that this could lead to like a bubble in the price of, of risk-free assets? In other words, could we be overpricing risk-free assets? And do you think that's a possibility, and what would be the implication to in terms of what you've just talked about? So, it's a very good question. The, 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 uh, the concept of a, of a risk-free security is a, is a difficult one, uh, and uh, from, a, from, from a modeling or pricing perspective, it is not difficult to adapt what we're doing to accommodate the fact that there is some possibility that certain sovereigns would would renege on their obligations or default on their debt, and we can develop models that handle that. and And I've done work on the past in, in that work, applying it mostly to developing countries. Uh, but now the the models are relevant for uh, for many developed countries, and that's part of the reason that the the IMF has become so interested in this, and that we've been working together on these these models and signals. But as you point out, there are institutional regulatory reasons for people to hold certain classes of debt. And, uh, and I think you're, you're, you're right that what we're seeing is um, a, a flight not only to liquidity but a flight to quality that is, uh, has been very helpful for the U.S. Treasury market. It's kept tre Treasury yields very low and uh, much lower than people thought that they would be. Uh, and, uh, and it's also uh, the reason, one of the reasons that German yields have been falling in the current environment. Um, it is surely the case, both in the U.S. and Germany, that, um, uh, that the safe haven aspect of, of those markets that's attracting investors and the regulatory incentives for them to go into those markets are pushing yields down, uh, probably below levels that would be consistent absent these regulatory incentives. Uh, uh, below that would be consistent with the, the, the fiscal balances of these countries. Um, I mean, I think uh, uh, there, there certainly is some question about the horizon over which the U.S. will, uh, will address its, its fiscal issues, and, and if it does address them in part through much higher inflation in the future, then that raises issues about inflation risk premia that are very subdued in the markets right now. And, uh, and even over long horizons, they're quite subdued. Uh, and and, and it, w one could challenge or, or, or wonder about that. And then, um, and then in Germany, there's certainly a big open question about their long-term uh, ultimate obligation for Europe and, uh, and the banking system within Germany. So I guess I see it as, as creating uh, unusually low spreads in these countries because of this flight to uh, uh, to quality and the incentives for institutions to position themselves there. Uh, it's perfectly reasonable and rational behavior, given the constraints. Uh, I do think that, uh, that it's timely for, uh, for Basel to be thinking about uh, uh, shifting away from zero risk rates uh, on, uh, on, on, uh, on most, if, if maybe not even many, or all, not almost all sovereign, uh, sovereign bonds. And, uh, and, and that hasn't happened yet. So I have a question regarding the possibility of having early warning systems that are based on sort of market, market information. Yeah. Because one might think that to have a financial crisis, what you need is that some important financial actors haven't properly acknowledged the, some type of risk that then happens. Yes. So if you think that we would have a IMF would actually be able to develop such a warning system, it would never predict any more crisis because people would take uh, actions that prevent those crises from actually occurring. So can yeah. we, it's, it's like the efficient market <coughs> hypothesis in some sense. Can we really believe that, or can we really hope for efficient uh, early warning systems? Uh, that's a good question. I, 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 uh, 
I share that uh, um, that skepticism. Let me let me try to give a couple of um, uh, optimistic uh, spins on on that. One of the things we see uh, prior to many most financial crises are risk premiums that are anomalous. Uh, typically, in, in a crisis situation, are unusually low relative to what after the fact, we all agree, <laughs> uh, and uh, it, 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 you, I'm sure you've had this experience where uh, uh, you maybe thought yourself and or talked with others that after the fact, you look back at the data and say, well, of course things were on just you know, implausibly uh, low. How could that possibly have been sustained? So for example, if you go back to the, the late 1990s and uh, uh, and looked at, at, at Russian bonds prior to the Russian default and the collapse of long-term capital management and, and all that took place in the summer of 1998. And if you had used a term structure model to fit to Russian bonds to back out what the implied short-term interest rates on Russian bonds were from that model, you would have seen that Russian bonds were trading at yields below uh, dollar, dollar LIBOR. So uh, it's you know things were getting better in Russia and people were optimistic about Russia and the uh, the economy looked fine oil prices were and oil revenues were were, were sound uh, but still one might have said should they have been trading at yields lower than LIBOR at that time in the late 1990s and then six months later the spreads were 10 percent not the yields the spreads to to, to dollar LIBOR were 10 percent. So um, if you had looked at that data through that lens and said, this is just implausible, even if we're not going to have a crisis, it's just unsustainable to think that the conditions in Russia warranted spreads below, that far below LIBOR. As it turns out, when we were researching this, we, we, we got a, an, an email from a hedge fund that, uh, that shared exactly that view and in fact positioned against uh, uh, a deterioration in the value of these Russian bonds. And one of the striking things about that case that's intriguing is that even when things started to deteriorate through, the, uh, it, through August of, uh, 2000, of 1998, rather, and yield spreads got fairly wide, uh, it's apropos to how we would build this into models, you might think that it had all been built into the market. So when Russia defaulted, there really was not much new news in that. Everybody expected it to happen by the time spreads were out there at 8 or 10 percent. In fact, if you had bought Russian bonds, at the euro bonds, at the beginning of the week that Russia defaulted on some domestic debt, uh, you would have lost 80 percent of your principal in the week. So uh, the, 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 the loss had not been built in at all, even though spreads were trading at enormous levels. So there's both uh, very big risks associated with spreads widening, but there's very big risks associated with uh, event risk when, when there is a default. But in any event, I think we see anomalous behavior. And so it does show up in these markets. And the question is, is sort of reading the tea leaves in a way to, uh, to make something of it. So I think the hope that the IMF sees from an early warning system is that they get a signal that shows up in markets that leads them to have a discussion. It, it's just one piece of information, one more piece of information that forces a roundtable discussion about what's going on. And, and, and maybe something instructive comes out of that if they can generate uh, you know, crosstalk and uh, and debate, and and, and that's the, that's the goal, that's the objective. Uh, but uh, but and 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 there will be many false positives in the sense from something like this. There'll be many times that they'll come up with explanations and no crisis ensues, and and that's fine. But at least it'll just be another signal they can use for dialogue and thinking about it. But I I think it is an ambitious thing from a from a from an accurate predictability point of view. But they're not trying to. To, to bet on the next crisis. They're trying to just extract information from the markets that gives them one more signal or perspective on what's going on. Um, this is somewhat technical, so I apologize in advance. Uh, um, I was intrigued by this argument that you made, um, some, you know, somewhat dismissing these um, um, models based on uh, macro factors only. Yes. And so if, and some, somehow, the way I interpret it is, well, your focus was on the Taylor rule type of equation, and you seem yes. to, 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 to dismiss that as a useful, as a useful instrument. No? But 
if I understood the, the, the logic of your argument correctly, which of, no, you didn't have time to, to, no, to explain in detail, at some point there must have been um, some maintained assumption um, that you didn't uh, spell out that uh, investors' forecasts about future inflation and future output gaps and so on are um, linear functions of the current values of those variables so that you know, somehow you can invert the whole thing and, and you can write you know, current GDP growth or current inflation and so on as a linear function of the current uh, term structure. Right. And then you, know, you, you, know, you run this regression and obviously, not surprisingly, it's a bit, it's a bit of a, a, a disappointment or a disaster yes. and so on. But I think that's a very, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, maybe, mm. but uh, th if that's the case, I think that's a very strong assumption that has nothing to do with the Taylor rule. And, and the other, the, the Taylor rule is an instrument that was originally developed by, by, by your colleague, uh, John Taylor, as, mm. a, as a, a description of, of the evolution of the policy rate. And uh, as far as I can tell, the only way to judge the, the value of that instrument is by looking at the policy rate and the extent to which you know, inflation, the output gap, or you name it, explains the evolution of the policy rate. Whereas your argument used the Taylor rule, used, as you said, some model of the term structure plus some uh, model of uh, investors' expectations. Sorry for taking so long. So everything you said is accurate, and uh, so let me say a little bit more, uh, but briefly. Um, the way these models have been developed in this blend of macro finance, and it's that sort of genre of models that's worked its way into what is being used at many central banks now. At least I know the ECB has models like this, uh, the um, uh, Federal Reserve uses them because Ben Bernanke cites them and some of, I know many of the people who have been working on developing these models. Uh, they start with a Taylor rule-like equation like I wrote down. Uh, you're right, they, they assume that inflation and output and, uh, and interest rates uh, evolve according to a vector order regression or a linear time series model sometimes with stochastic volatility, with volatility moving around in a state-dependent way, sometimes without. And, uh, and then it is in that context that they solve for the whole yield curve uh, under the principles of no arbitrage. And then you get this linearity of yields in terms of the underlying risk factors. It's prices themselves are nonlinear, but the yields are linear. And all of that's being maintained. So, in fact, this representation, this equation that they write down and use and that I have been using here, it looks like a Taylor rule, but in fact it can't be interpreted as a Taylor rule because it's not identified as a Taylor rule. This is really a reduced form model. There's no structure. And that in itself is, 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 is a separate point that I didn't get into today. But you can show that you can get many different observationally equivalent representations that look nothing like a Taylor rule and can't be interpreted as a Taylor rule. So it's a, it's a, it's a treacherous mindset to begin with. Um, but I raise it because it's exactly, it's very convenient, it's tractable, it's analytically simple by comparisons of much more complicated models to work with, um, and, uh, and yet fairly rich in the dynamics that it builds in. And so it's not natural that central bankers have been adopting these and that many academics have been working with them. But in that class of models, all these problems arise. Now, the, I'm not commenting on taking an actual structural Taylor rule, embedding it into so-called dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. There's a lot of nonlinearity, and, uh, and, and those models are going to behave very differently. But it is the case that many of the macro economists working with so-called long-run risks or habit formation, the so-called preference-based models of asset pricing, all of those models actually can be mapped exactly into the setting I was talk today, talking about today, and all of the issues arise uh, with those models equally. Um, so macroeconomists, at least to a significant degree, have tried to simplify their models, take approximations, and map them into these linear settings, and then the same issues arise. In more complicated nonlinear models, we would still have inversion issues, but it wouldn't be a simple linear regression. Having said all of that, I think the 
basic principle that I've been enunciating here carries over to those models as well. That our equilibrium models are not likely to deal very well with the fact that whether I run linear or nonlinear projections, there's a big part of output growth that is orthogonal to separate with from or uncorrelated with the yield curve. We need to think about models where the effective number of risks in a market, like in the Spanish bond market, that, that, that describes the movements in the shape of the yield curve is fairly small. But the risk premia we associate with those movements and risks involve information that's much richer and outside the market. And, uh, and we don't do a very good job of that in many of our models. Thank you. Thank you.